Okay, before we get started, are there any questions about midterm on Friday? Okay, no questions, great. So uh, remember you can bring a single sheet of paper, handwritten notes on one side, not two sides, and um, no like photocopied notes. So the intention is that you, you can write something on your iPad, that's fine, and you can you know, print it out, but just don't be photocopying the lecture notes or exam solutions or things like that. Um, and yeah, uh, no, no calculators, phones, or anything like that will be needed. Okay, great. So let's continue our discussion. So we have a unit on optimization. We want to do things like solve this optimization problem that we need for training logistic regression. And we said that we're going to take a close look at the gradient. <clears throat> and one of the things we're going to do is um, extend the definition of the gradient from gradient with respect to a vector to gradient with respect to a matrix. And in any case, it's just the set of partial derivatives with regard to whatever parameter you are trying to optimize. We saw some examples. And we started talking about first order approximations, which are things we can, which is a tool we can use in different ways. <clears throat> so the idea here is that the cost or loss that we are optimizing is always going to be nonlinear in our parameters. However, um, if we take a reference point here called omega naught, and if we look in a small neighborhood of that reference point, <clears throat> then Assuming that this original cost is differentiable at that point here, we can, we, we will find that it's approximately linear right around that reference point. And so that's going to be a useful tool. We'll use it in various ways. So we started like the, in the simplest case here with um, scalar inputs, and then we repeated this for vector inputs. And we saw that the only thing that changed in this Taylor series was that this term now is replaced by a sum of partial derivatives with respect to the different parameters in the input times the deviations of that parameter from the reference version. And then instead of having a single quadratic in this big O term, we now have sum of square terms, the, the Euclidean norm squared. Okay, and then we saw that um, we can, with this Taylor series, we can say that the original function is approximately equal to the original function at the reference plus an inner product between the gradient and the deviation from that reference. And so what we did going from here to here is we ignored this big O term and then that turned the equals into an approximation and this is approximation is going to be good as long as we're close enough to our reference. Okay, so that's what we did next. Then we used this to uh, prove that what the gradient does is it tells us the direction of maximum increase of J as well as the slope. So here's a picture of it. Um, in this case, these are the parameters. There's two of them. This is the reference point in the parameter plane. Here is the function. And when we're at this point, the gradient, which is going this way, is pointing in the direction uh, that brings us uphill the steepest. And moreover, if we look at the slope in that direction, that is going to be the norm of the gradient. Okay. And we did this using that um, Taylor series or that, that linear approximation that we learned. So this is the first time we're using it, but we'll use it several more times. Okay, any questions on, on this? Okay, so this brings us to the matrix valued extension. So here we have, again, a function that produces a scalar output, but now it takes in a whole matrix of quantities, and this matrix has terms W, I, J. <coughs> so the way that we write the Taylor series now, maybe it's not so surprising. We again 
look at the reference, look at the value function at the reference, but now we have a double sum over the terms i and j, which index through that matrix. So i will go from 1 to d, j will go from 1 to k, and then we're going to have the um, partial derivative of j at the reference matrix, but with respect to parameter wij. And this is going to be multiplied by the deviation of wij from the reference uh, value at ij. And then we have a big O term, which measures the sum of the squares of all the different terms in the W matrix relative to the reference. And so now we use the Frobenius norm for that, since we know that the Frobenius norm squared of a matrix is just the sum of the squares of all the terms. Okay, so that's what we have here. So the generalization is instead of a single term or a sum, we have a double sum over all the different wij's in this w. Okay, so hopefully you can see the pattern. Um, <clears throat> any questions on this first equation? Okay, so um, let's try to write it in a more compact way that doesn't involve sums. So to do that, the first step is to figure out how these quantities relate to matrices. So if we look at this one, it's pretty clear that this is just the ijth entry of this matrix difference, capital W minus capital W naught. And if we look at this term, this is just the ijth component of the gradient matrix. <clears throat> but in order to make this look like a matrix multiplication, what we're going to do is we're going to put a transpose on the gradient matrix, which allows us to swap i and j here. And now, if you visualize it, you have a matrix here where you're going j down the rows, i across the columns. And you have another matrix here, i down the rows, j across the columns. <clears throat> and if we also swap the order of the sums, now we're summing over that inner index. So that allows us to think of this as a matrix multiplication. So this is now a matrix multiplication. Um, <clears throat> in particular, we have the multiplication of our gradient matrix, valued at W naught, transpose this difference matrix. Actually, maybe I'll use a round parentheses here. <clears throat> However, we're not quite done. So this is, this is an entire matrix, but this term is actually a scalar, right? So we actually need to say which term of this matrix gives us, sorry, gives us this bracketed expression. So let me ask, uh, right, is William Sears Potowski here? Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think? Which, which element of this big matrix are we talking about here? We're just talking about the diagonals. Exactly. So in particular, this is the jth row and the jth column. <clears throat> and we can see that because there's a j here and there's a j there. So then what we're actually doing is we're summing across the diagonal of this matrix because we're summing across all the j's. So in linear algebra, that operation is known as the trace. The trace is the sum of the diagonal of a matrix. Okay, so after all this, we have been able to write this double sum <coughs> compactly as the trace of one matrix transpose another matrix. <clears throat> so that's a lot cleaner. And then the final step is if we throw away this uh, big O term, then we get an approximation that only, only involves the first two terms. 
And it turns out that this second term here is the inner product between this matrix, the gradient, and this difference matrix. Okay, so remember how last time I told you that the inner product is a general notion of, you could say, orientation, uh, rel two, two quantities, how one is oriented relative to the other. So um, I know you guys have seen that a lot with um, one-dimensional vectors, but it exists for any kind of generic objects in a vector space, including matrices. So here we see that if you have two matrices and you want to say what is the inner product, or what's like the relative orientation, the angle between them, you can define the inner product, and it turns out it's the trace of the first transpose the second. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's the point here, that this is how you do the inner product um, of two real-valued matrices. So I'm curious, how many people have seen this before? Okay, not many, but a few. Great, okay, so it's, it's a useful thing to know about, so um, glad you could see it here. Um, yeah, so I think, and we, we covered all these things here. So at the end of the day, when you look back over what we've done, you can see that um, these expressions are identical. You always can write J at an arbitrary W, or let's say J at W close to a reference. You can approximate it as J at the reference plus the inner product between the gradient and the difference. You can do that in this vector case. You can do it in the matrix case. The only thing that changes is the definition of the inner product. In fact, you can do it in the um, that first scalar case, it works too. It's just that this the inner product for scalars is kind of trivial. It's just the multiplication of them. So, okay, so that's, that's sort of what we see here is that we have this, this formula here. <clears throat> okay, so we've seen linear approximations of Scalar ma uh, vector matrix. Any questions on this? All right, let's, let's practice a little bit with a um, particular example. <clears throat> so here's our example. So maybe let's try to visualize what this is. So I have a fixed vector A. So trans I'm transposing it, multiplying it times this matrix W, multiplying it times the column vector B. That gives me a scalar, and I need a scalar to have a scalar valued cost. <clears throat> okay, so that's how we're going to construct it. You can see that this is a function of this matrix, so we'd like to see, you know, how can I do the, um, the linear approximation? How do I go through all the mechanics of what we just did for this example? <clears throat> all right, so first step is when we do Calculus with matrices and vectors, I always recommend going back to the scalar case where calculus is a lot easier rather than trying to do calculus in the vector matrix case because um, you can do it if you know what you're doing, but you know if you're not that experienced with it, go back to the scalar case. So if we want to go back to the scalar case, what we have to do is we have to write this using summations. So that's the first question. How do I write this thing using summations? Um, so let me see, is Aiden Short here? All right, what do you think? So uh, let's, let's, uh, I'll give you a hint. Let's, let's use for, for A, let's write this as, we'll start with A1, AJ, all the way to the, to the end. Um, I don't know. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Let's, let's call it. So we want to use J as the index in the A vector. So how do we start? Double sum. Double sum. Very good. So this first sum, let's be over J. Second sum, let's, let's say over K. So then we have A, J, and then what? <clears throat> okay. So what do I do with the W? So we need two indices on W. <coughs> oh, let's do K, J and K, sorry, yeah. Okay, and then? B sub K, right? Because what we got here is we have J going this way, K 
okay going this way. So then everything matches up. <clears throat> okay, so now that we have this written in terms of the individual parameters, we have a better shot of deriving the gradient matrix. So again, for the gradient matrix, let's simplify that and let's look at one single entry in that matrix. And I'm gonna write this as the J prime row and the K prime column. The reason I'm not writing J and K is because I don't wanna be confusing because we're already using J and K as the dummy variables in these sums. And so if I would use them again, we could maybe get a little bit confusing. So I'm just coming up with different names, J prime and K prime. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with this. How do I define the J prime row and K prime column of the gradient matrix? So let me ask, let's see, is Lokesh Nantha Kumar here? Okay, what about um, Blake Morse? What about Armin Mazad? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so how do I define that? Exactly. Yeah, the, the, <coughs> the summation above and you would end up, I think, with just A, J times B, J in summation. Okay, well, let's, let's, so first we're just, yeah, all we're doing first is we are defining it. So we have D, J, and then what's on the bottom, D? Uh, w. Which? Uh, J, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, right, J prime, yeah. K prime. Okay. So we're so because this this J involves all the W's, but here I'm just looking at the partial derivative with respect to a particular one. Okay, now that we have that, I think you are already moving on to the next stage. So <clears throat> yeah, so if if you look at this expression, yeah, what what did you decide for the the simplification of this? Okay, so, so here's the thing. So this, I'm looking here at a single parameter, not, I'm taking the partial derivative with only respect to a single one, not all of them, right? This sum contains all of them. It has all the different JKs. So, so now I'm just focusing on one. So do I need the sums? Um, no. Right, yeah, I don't need the sums because you could also imagine, instead of writing this as a sum, write it as a sequence of this plus the next one plus the next one for all combinations of J and K. Only one of those combinations is going to match this J prime, K prime. All the others will go away when you take this derivative. And so the one that remains looks like this, but it has J prime and K prime. And so now when we take the partial derivative of that, it's easy, right? Because it's linear in W J prime, K prime. So the all remains, all that remains is a j prime and times b k prime. Okay. So just, we have a pretty simple example, but I just wanted to go through all the steps to make sure that this is making sense because this is the sort of thing you'll have to do, homeworks, labs, maybe exams, and so on. <clears throat> okay, is everybody good with this first step? Okay, no questions? All right, great. So now, um, I don't know, maybe this is slightly harder, but how do I turn this, which, which is a particular element of the gradient, how do I turn that back into the entire gradient matrix? I know that this works for all values of J prime and K prime, so how do I go backwards to get the whole matrix? So let me see, is Ethan Hartman here? Yeah, what do you think? Yeah. How do I do that? Exactly. It's going to depend, it's going to involve the A and B vectors, right? Because that's where those coefficients. Transfer back to the factor notation? Yeah, that's our goal. <laughs> exactly. We want to we want to write it back in terms of vector notation. That's really the only thing we have for A and B. And that should give us an entire matrix if we do it right. <clears throat> so would it be A times B transpose? Exactly. A vector times B vector transpose. So to visualize it, we have A, B transpose. Um, as we come down 
the rows, we were indexing that by J prime as we were going across the columns, indexing that by K prime. And you see this is going to give us exactly what we want. And in fact, this is going to, when you do that multiplication, you get an entire matrix. <clears throat> so is that clear to everyone? Okay, nice work. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so we have, yeah, we, we've now derived our gradient matrix. Um, <clears throat> and and it, as you can see, I think it's just like when you're given something like this and asked to compute the gradient, it's kind of complicated but there's, because there's this whole matrix involved with other stuff. And so the recommended procedure is just write this back in terms of scalar quantities, do your scalar calculus, which we all know how to do, and then come back to the matrix case by constructing matrices from those scalar results. Okay, so that's exactly what we've done here. Okay, so now that we've done that, we're ready to um, finally do the linear approximation of J at that reference point. So just taking directly the equation that we derived uh, in the previous page, this is where we start. So now we know our gradient. It's A times B transpose, so we plug that in. Okay, now we have this quantity transposed. Oh, we also plugged in the original J, but evaluated at omega naught. Okay, so we have this. We're transposing that. So remember that when you transpose a product of things, you transpose them individually, but you have to swap the order too. So we, we transpose B, uh, B transpose, that turns into B. We transpose A, that turns into A transpose, but notice we've swapped the order. Okay. <clears throat> so um, now brings us to a really cool property of the trace. So as we know in linear algebra, in general, we cannot uh, change the order of operations. They don't commute. Um, but what's amazing is that when you put things inside a trace, they do commute. You're allowed to commute them once they're inside a trace because the eventual trace itself doesn't change. So we can use that trick to commute what's inside this trace. In particular, let's reorder that and this by putting B at the end. That gives us this quantity <clears throat> that's totally legal and then what we notice is that this is actually a scalar because it's a row times matrix times column so that's a scalar and the trace of a scalar is just that scalar itself so we can actually get rid of this trace after which we have that and then we notice that we can expand this into a transpose wb minus a transpose w naught b that latter one cancels with this, and we come back to this simplification. And when you step back and look at this, it was all kind of silly because what we find here is that the linear approximation of J, which is itself linear, is just that exact J. Okay. That happened because we started with a linear function, so when you do the linear approximation of a linear function, it's just itself. Nothing changes. Okay, so the point of all this was really just as an exercise to see how to do this uh, in general, just a simple problem, allows us to do some computations. <coughs> okay. Is everybody good with this example? Okay, great. Um, hopefully this is just helping to reinforce some of those linear algebra skills. Okay, great. So... Um, <coughs> And now let's talk about how we can implement this in Python. So <clears throat> again, we want to basically implement this stuff on this previous page. So we have this function to start with. So there's a couple different ways to do this. Um, the one that I've used here in the notes is to use the dot operation, um, which is really sort of a way to do dot products in Python, but it allows you when you have something like matrix times vector like this, it allows you to do a dot product between the first row and the vector, and then between the second row and the vector, and so on. And so this w dot b basically gives you the vector wb. And now that we have that vector and one other vector, I can use a dot product between a and the result of that to finally get j. <clears throat> There's another way to do this um, where you can use the ampersand sign in Python to do matrix multiplication. So there's other approaches. This is just the one that I wrote up here. 
Okay, so next, maybe a little bit more interesting, is how do we compute this gradient? We know that it has the form A times B transpose. <clears throat> but what's so in MATLAB, this would be very easy because MATLAB thinks of vectors as matrices. So A, you know, could be a row or a column vector in, matri in MATLAB. For this operation, you would want to make sure that it is in column form, and you'd want to make sure that this thing is in row form, and then you would just do uh, a matrix multiply in MATLAB. So Python is different in that when you have a vector in Python, it's just sort of a list of numbers, one-dimensional. It doesn't have any interpretation as column or row. It's just a list. And so we have to do th things a little bit differently in Python if we want to do this um, matrix, matrix multiplication, so to speak. <clears throat> so I think the slickest way of doing this is to use Python broadcasting. So we've talked about a little bit about this before. Python broadcasting is a generic way for us to leverage scalar valued operations, um, or Python's ability to do scalar valued operations even on vectors and matrices if they're given in a sensible form. So <clears throat> let me give you, um, well, okay, so I'll, I'll show you what we're gonna do. So, so this is sort of what we would like to do, maybe written you know, in, in one way. So we wanna compute the gradient matrix at entry, uh, row j, column k, we want that to be a, evaluated at entry j, b at column, entry k. <clears throat> but we want to, you know, make sure that this is a whole matrix. So this is how we do it. So what we're doing in this first part here is we're basically telling Python, expand this vector into a matrix. And it's kind of like saying, keep what you have in that vector going down along the rows, but just copy those columns. You know, this, this sort of says, you know, keep, keep, yeah, keep whatever you have going down the first column, but then as the rest of the columns, just copy them as many times as you need to make this operation legal. So as a visual example, if you started with this as your vector, then this a colon comma none is expanding it like this by copying that same thing over and over again. And it's gonna expand it to whatever dimension you need to do whatever operation you're trying to do. So in this, this here is, is slightly different than the code we're, in, we're doing. This is showing you how you can do addition of a column and a row, you know, what does that even mean? Well, the way that it's doing it here is expanding that column by sort of copying and pasting it, doing the same with the row. Now you have two matrices of equivalent dimensions, and you can do a scalar add at every entry, and so you would get this. So what we're doing in the code above is similar, but instead of a plus, there's a, a, an element-wise multiplication. So that's, that is how we're, that's how we're doing this. So here for B, it's basically saying, keep those entries of B in that first row, and then make as many rows as you need so that this has the same size as this. Okay, so it's a pretty cool way of, of doing this. Um, maybe not the only way, there's probably another way to do it with the at sign I didn't get into, but, um, but at least this is, this is one pretty slick way to do it. Okay, any questions about this Python broadcasting? Okay, so this is gonna be really useful in the lab for unit six. And otherwise, yeah, we're just creating some random, uh, random matrix, random vectors of the right length and plugging them into this function we defined and printing what comes out. <clears throat> okay, so any questions about Python broadcasting or this none? Okay, remember all the link, all the green links are hyperlinks. So if you want to click on the none, it will take you to the page that, the Python document page that describes none. So you can get into the details if you want. Okay, all right, great. No questions. Excellent. Okay, let's move on. So <clears throat> we're getting closer to what we really want to do in this unit, which is, um, which is build an algorithm to do this sort of optimization. Um, the last thing we do before we build that algorithm is to try to understand a little bit about um, maybe what can go wrong. 
And the main approach that we've been using since the beginning is to say, whenever you have points of zero slope, that could be a good place to find the minimum of function. But what we need to recognize now is there's other places where you get zero slope. So yes, it happens at minima. The slope is zero right there. But it also happens at maxima of functions as well. We didn't have to worry about this before because we were always dealing with quadratic functions where if they're pointed the right way, they only have a minima. They don't have any maxima. So we never had to worry about that. But in general, once you start working with other cost functions that you encounter machine learning, this is not necessarily the case anymore. So you do have to be aware that the, that the zero gradient points can happen at different places. <clears throat> so, um, so that's the point here. And there's actually three classes of, of points where you can get zero gradients. There's minimizers, maximizers, and what are called saddle points. So here is a picture of a saddle point. So for this surface here, right at that red point, if you looked in any direction, you would find there's exactly zero slope at that point. But what's maybe more interesting is that along one dimension, this is actually the minima. You know, sort of locally, it's the minima along that dimension. But along this other dimension, it's the maxima. And so it's just this sort of interesting thing. It's called a saddle. It's neither a minima nor a maxima, but it is a point of zero, zero gradient. And that's not the only way that you can get saddles. This is called a monkey saddle. So what's interesting about this saddle is that even the second derivative, or the curvature, is zero right in the center point. Whereas here, the curvature is negative in one direction and positive in the other. Here, it's actually zero in every direction. So it's an even different kind of saddle. Okay. But the main point here is that um, just looking for the the w's that zero the gradient is in general not enough. You have to also know whether this is going to be a minimizer, a maximizer, or a saddle, or a saddle. <clears throat> OK, any questions? OK, good. So um, now there's one other issue, is that you can actually have different kinds of minima, different kinds of maxima. So this is a picture where you have the global maxima, which is you know if you looked everywhere, this is the lowest value that the function can take. Maybe that's what we're after. but here we have a point which locally looks like pretty good value, but globally is not the best value. So this is called a local minima. This is called a global minima. So global minima is basically is a point uh, w hat where j at w hat is really less than or equal to j everywhere, whereas a local minima is defined such that it's within a neighborhood it's the best, but outside that neighborhood it may not be the best. <clears throat> okay, so our objective, if we could, would be to find a global minima. Um, the algorithm that we're going to derive in general won't do that for us. It's just going to find a local minimum. However, there's a special case of really, you know, of great importance, which is if we have a convex function, which is something I'll talk about later in the unit, then any local minim minima is also a global minima. So this is wonderful. If you have a convex function, you don't have to worry about having these sort of bad local minima. You can be content that if you find the local minima, it's also going to be global. So that's the, what's great about convex functions. Um, the one we're working with in this unit, this logistic uh, cross-entropy loss, this is, this is convex. So it is one of these ones where if we can find the, the, a, a place of, of zero gradient and, um, and it's a minimum, then that's, that's it. That's, that's the global minimum. <coughs> All right, any questions? OK, so here, finally, is the algorithm. So our objective is to find a local minimizer of this function j. So um, <clears throat> we want to do this. Um, and I'll say uh, at least locally. So the way that I wrote it here is, is technically um, globally, but we're going to have to be content with locally in this in this case. And <clears throat> another point is that um, we are not placing any constraints on the values of our w's. Like we're not saying they have to be positive or something like that. So uh, for that reason, we call this optimization unconstrained. Later, we will briefly talk about what happens when 
we want to place constraints on these, like, for example, maybe that they're all positive or something like that. In that case, we have a slightly more complicated problem, but we'll talk about that in a moment. And we'll also assume that this is differentiable everywhere so that we can always compute the gradient wherever we want. So finally, the algorithm goes like this. Maybe I'll state it in words first. Take, you initialize somewhere, you take small downhill steps until you reach the bottom. That's the idea in words. So in a picture, it's like this. You start, let's say at this point, you look for the gradient. The gradient is pointing uphill, right, in the steepest direction. You go opposite that, you go downhill, steepest direction. But you have to be careful how far you travel. Like if I go in this direction, but I travel all the way over here, I'm actually at a worse off point than where I started, right? I've moved in the right direction, it seems, but I've moved too far. So we want to take a small downhill step. Let's say that brings us here. Now we reevaluate the gradient here. Now it's pointing in a slightly different direction. Take another downhill step. That brings us here. We keep repeating this procedure over and over and over. And you can see that in general we're going to be changing our direction, but we should be getting closer and closer to the solution, which in this case it's, it's a quadratic and it's, it's down there. <coughs> so that's sort of um, in words, in pictures, and then in terms of the math, we can run it like this. Um, the w vector, and I'm going to, in parentheses, I'm going to write this with, uh, in superscript parentheses, that is going to denote the iteration. Okay, so this is not the power, this is the iteration. And I don't want to put it in the subscript because we have already have a different case where we have different WK vectors that mean the different predictors in multinomial logistic regression. So that's why it's in the superscript with the parentheses. So what we're saying is that then the step we're creating, the next place we're going, is the old one minus some small positive number, which we'll call alpha K, times the gradient of the cost at our old location. So that's how we can write it mathematically. So here we have negative gradient, small step. That is the update to our old location to get our new location. Okay, so this is a simple algorithm, but it's sort of like the workhorse idea under which all machine learning algorithms are based. They're all modifications of this. <coughs> okay, so any questions on, so this is called gradient descent. Okay, so we are taking small downhill steps, get closer and closer. <coughs> you might also ask, well, how do, you, how do you know where to start? So. It depends. Um, in some applications, you have some notion of where to start. In other applications, you don't. And so you would just choose your initialization randomly. <clears throat> OK. All right. So um, how, many, how many of you guys have heard of gradient descent? OK, great. Any questions on this? All right, so let's try to convince ourselves that this actually works. So we're going to use the Taylor expansion again and, and show, yeah, maybe a little bit more convincingly that this will actually take us to our minimum. So we have a function, j. We have our old point, wk. So I apologize here. I am not using the parentheses up there. I'm just using k alone. <clears throat> um, So if we write the Taylor expansion, we have j at this reference point, wk, plus the gradient, j at the reference, transpose the deviation of w from the reference, plus the big O term of the squared norm 
of that deviation. So this is um, <clears throat> this is what we're starting with, and so the first step is to say, well, let's evaluate this at the place we're going to, which is the next iteration, w k plus one. So wherever we see w, we just replace that with w k plus one, and so that gives us this. <clears throat> now, gradient descent update. We know something in particular. We know that the difference between the new and the old is just the step we've taken, which we know is minus alpha k times the gradient evaluated at the old location. And so we can plug that in any time we see this difference appear, which is those two places. So as a result of that, um, this is another gradient. So we have gradient transpose gradient. We can pull out the negative alpha k here. And then over here, we also have gradient norm squared. But let's pull out the alpha k from that norm squared, and it will turn into alpha k squared. The negative inside the norm doesn't do anything. Um, the norm doesn't change if you put a negative in there. OK, so now notice that this vector transpose times itself is just the norm squared. So now you can see that there's some similarities there. <clears throat> and what we'd like to do is figure out under what conditions we will see an improvement in our algorithm. So we're starting at WK. We're going to WK plus 1. We want the cost to decrease, right? We want to decrease the cost every time. So when is this new cost lower than the old cost? So does the first term help us to decrease the cost? Is this, is this helpful? Is it decreasing the cost? In other words, yes, it's negative, right? No matter what, or it's, it can never be positive. This is 0 or, or positive. This is step size is also positive. So this is always helping us achieve our goal. What about this? Is this helping us or hurting us? Hurting, hurting right? This is always positive. So this is actually you know, making it such that we may not decrease, we may actually increase. And we know that that's possible because we saw this example like I could go in this direction and I could actually end up with a larger cost than where I started. So that is explained by this term. <clears throat> okay, but now let's look closer at this big O. We said that, okay, if we're in the neighborhood of the reference, which means, okay, if we're in the neighborhood of the reference, that means that this is not too big. And we can actually control that by making a alpha k small. We can always make sure that we're in the neighborhood of a reference. Well, in that case, we can upper bound this by c times um, the norm of, actually, c times alpha k squared times the norm of the gradient at WK. Okay, so now what's useful about this is that we don't have this um, vague big O. We actually have something concrete. And this is an upper bound. But we know that, okay, at least this is an upper bound. So we have this concrete term. And actually, that term looks very similar in spirit to this term. The only difference is in these scalars that are in front of them. <clears throat> so now, I want to convince you that if the step size is small enough, this term will always overwhelm this term, and therefore we will decrease. So 
the key is in the fact that this one has an alpha k and this one has an alpha k squared. So let me pose it to you this way. Can you find a version of alpha k, a specific value, such that these things are, are equal, that this is equal to this? What would that value of alpha k be? So if it's 1, that would be 1, and this would be c. So how do I make them equal? 1 over, 1 over c, right? This becomes 1 over c. This also becomes 1 over c. So... Okay, so when alpha is 1 over c, those two terms are balanced, at least in terms of this upper bound. So that means that, okay, for that value of alpha, we don't really know whether we're going to be making any progress. We might not be. But if alpha is smaller than 1 over c, what, what ha if I have a small number and I square it, does it get bigger or smaller? If, it, if, I, if it's less than 1 and I square it, it actually gets even smaller. So... Yeah, so basically, if 1 over c is less than 1, and I square it, this, this actually is smaller and smaller than this. So, so that's, that's the goal, is that <clears throat> if alpha is less than 1 over c, then this term is weaker than this, this term dominates, and we actually make progress because of this negative sign. <clears throat> so that's sort of the proof. We don't actually know what c is. We never know what c is, but the point is, no matter what c is, we can always, one can always find an alpha k that is small enough. So for any c, as long as you make alpha k small enough, this will work. Okay, so that is the whole goal. Hopefully now we understand a little bit more confidently that yes, gradient descent will work as long as that step size really is small enough. <clears throat> okay, so that, that was the goal of this. Any questions on this? Yes. Isn't there supposed to be a gradient so we can equate it to the next equation? Or am I oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot to write the, the upside-down triangle. Thank you. There should be a little triangle in there. That is the gradient, exactly. So that is how we got, that's how we got the gradient um, here. And here. Thanks. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, great. So... Okay, so that's gradient descent. Um, <clears throat> so now we have the method. We can apply this to the problem of this unit, which is to minimize this binary cross entropy loss, which is what we use for logistic regression. We'll use the flavor of it uh, where we have 0, 1 labels, which takes this form. And still, it's a little bit complicated because, in some sense, this loss is written in two parts. There's one part that relates the loss j to these z terms, the i terms. But then there's another part that relates the z i terms to the w that is what we have control over, what we're trying to minimize. So, um, so basically, we want to kind of exploit this two-step structure of the problem, which shows up in many, many problems in machine learning. So this first problem, sorry, the first stage, um, we can, we can write it a different way. If you stack all the z's together in a vector, all the zi's together in a vector, bold z, then you get, as we know, a times w, right? Because we know the a matrix is constructed by concatenating those rows on top of each other. We saw that back in unit two. So there's just another way of writing it. So we can think about this first stage as essentially described by this linear operation. We start with a vector w, multiply by a matrix A to get a vector Z. And here I'm just writing that Z as if it was a function of W. So sort of like Z is some function of W given by this. <clears throat> so that's the first stage. The second stage is you take that vector Z, you pull it apart into its elements, and each element you actually treat separately. So that is called a separable function. The first one is linear, second one is separable. Separable meaning each guy, z, is treated independently like this. So there's actually just a sum of scalar functions. That's nice because that's a lot easier to deal with. We don't have to worry about some complicated vector value, vector input, vector output function. It's just 
nope, these are scalar functions, they get added together. So that's the structure. If you think about the overall thing here, it's complicated because not only is it a nonlinear function between w and j, but the w coefficients all get mixed together in a complicated way. <clears throat> when we split it up this way, the first stage is simple because it's linear, but complicated because the w's get mixed together. The second stage is complicated because it's nonlinear, but simple because the, the z's stay apart, they're separable. So we can exploit those two sort of somewhat easy stages to actually derive the gradient. So this is the overall, the overall j we can think of it this way. You start with w, that gets processed to become z, that gets processed by f to become j. So it's like, we call that composition of two functions. So now that we have this structure, we can use what's called the multivariable chain rule from calculus, and this is something we're gonna be starting to use over and over again. Um, so this is the first time we'll see it, but by no means the last. So <clears throat> what we wanna do is this. This is the jth component of the gradient, dj, dwj. And that multivariable chain rule says, basically, you do df, dzi, times dzi, dwj, so you can break it into two different gradients, but you have to sum across all the different entries z here. I don't know if it, it helps to draw a little picture, but it's kind of like this. You start with a bunch of wj terms. <clears throat> These get mixed together by this A matrix to get your zi terms, but then the zi terms individually um, get summed together to get your final cost j. <clears throat> and what this multivariable uh, chain rule is saying graphically is that if I wanna know the gradient between the dj, d, one of these wj's, I have to keep in mind that the information is flowing across different paths. So it's sort of like saying that overall gradient is the sum of the gradient here, gradient here, gradient here, and gradient here. So that is where that sum is coming from. And then these gradients, those guys we can compute without too much difficulty because f is separable and z is linear. So that's sort of the bird's eye view of, of what we're doing with this multivariable chain rule. All that's left is just the details of, of those derivatives. Any questions on this sort of big picture? Okay, so we're, we're gonna be seeing this a lot, but um, okay, so, all right, so let's, let's tackle this first. So we, we wanna do this, df, dzi. So here's our, um, Okay, yeah, so this is the equation. This is f, this is zi. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying I'm only in, interested in a particular i. So that means in this sum, I can focus on just one of these terms because the rest of the terms are not a function of this zi, so forget about them. So now I focus on the one I'm, look, one I'm interested in, which is this. So how do I do d this dzi? So let me ask, is Jack Lanza here? Yeah, so. Yeah. So we're just, we're just doing DZI of this. So there's no W's involved. Uh, so if you're just doing that, then it'd be uh, one over one plus dzi. Exactly. Um, you have to also multiply that part by dzi. Exactly. And then dz minus one. Exactly, right. So we did chain rule again. So chain rule, so when you're doing d, the log, you have one over the entire thing. And then we have to do d that entire thing, zi, which we have an exponential. So when you take the derivative of an exponential, you get that same exponential. Ezi, and then dz. That's just uh, yi. 
Okay, great. So that's what we have for the first stage. Um, let's, let's make it a little simpler by removing one of those exponent, exponents. So we can do this by putting in the denominator e minus zi plus 1 minus yi. Okay. And this is with computation in mind. Um, when you evaluate functions like exponentials, they're relatively very expensive compared to multiplications and additions. So we want to minimize how many times we have to do that. So instead of doing it twice, let's do it once. <clears throat> okay. Great. So everybody good on how we got this? Okay. Next one, how do we do DZI DWJ? So that is coming from this. But again, my recommendation is let's do scalar calculus, not vector calculus. So let's write this in terms of ZI. ZI equals, how do we write this in terms of the A and the W? A, a quantities. So let's see, Simon Hoppe here. Yeah. So there's going to be some, right? Yeah. So let's use... Let's use J as the index for these W's. So then the sum is going to be over. <clears throat> so this is a vector, right? I'm just looking at one element in it. This is a matrix, so I want to look at that row times this. Exactly. Good. Now that we've done that, this is pretty clear, right? How do we do DZIDWJ? Let's see, is Khaled Hamil here? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that would be just AIJ. AIJ, exactly. Okay. <clears throat> so that's sort of this divide and conquer strategy. We started with this really convoluted. Um, cost function involved nonlinearity and mixing of, of the W's together was kind of a mess. And we said, okay, we can break this apart into two stages. We can then use a multivariable chain rule. The gradients for each stage individually are tractable. Then the total gradient is going to be, is going to come out of that sum. So this is the generic strategy we're going to be using uh, to optimize our cost functions. <clears throat> Okay, so um, everybody good with this? All right. So the next page is just going through how we implement this um, in code. We, if we're careful, we can do it in just a few lines. Uh, but uh, it's, it's over time already, so um, let's save this for, for next week. And um, so good luck on your final preparations for the midterm. And um, see you guys here on Friday. But have office hours tomorrow. Okay.